Life Audio. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? Or have you been in a season where it feels like He's completely silent? Have you been praying for a way to learn how to hear His voice more clearly? Hey friends, I'm Rachel, host of the Hearing Jesus Podcast. If you are ready to grow in your faith and to confidently step into your identity in Christ, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl. Today we're actually doing something a little bit different. We're doing a Q&A session. I try to do these at least once a month because I get questions every day from listeners. And especially when I get the same questions multiple times throughout the month, I realize that there's a need to address it. And I like the way we can kind of have more of a discussion or what feels like a discussion. I guess it's one-sided, but I can kind of answer some of these questions in a way that might not otherwise fit our devotional type format. And also by giving you a little bit of a break, usually on Fridays, it helps you catch up from the content from the rest of the week. So if you have questions that you would like to have answered on the podcast, you can either email me and somebody on my team will make sure that I get that email. It's rachel at shehears.org, or you can message or write something in the group. We have the Christian Women's Daily Bible Study Group, and we also have the Patreon group. So lots of opportunities for you to message me your questions. I'll try to address them. So the first question I have today, it says, my biggest struggle is why God and Jesus make our lives hard if they love us. Why do bad things happen? Well, I think this is an age old question. You are not alone in asking this question, but I think there is a couple of things fundamentally wrong with the question itself. And, and while I would say there are no bad questions, I think there is bad theology in questions. And I think in some ways it makes me really, really sad that you're asking this question. So I, I think there's really two questions here. So the first is, is why do Jesus and God make our lives hard if they love us? Well, First of all, I guess there's two different things that are going on here. We have to recognize that being a Christian doesn't necessarily mean that our life will be easy. If that were the case, we wouldn't be talking about Jesus who literally died on a cross. Right now, we're going through the Gospel of Matthew and we're learning about John the Baptist who was beheaded. And we're learning about the apostles, which we're going to start to see here eventually you know, they, most all of them were martyred. And so just because we're believers doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be easy. It does mean that it's going to be worth it. It does mean that he's going to be with us, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be easy. Also, if we are followers of God and we are doing what God has called us to do, it also means that we have a target on our backs from the enemy. And I think that brings me to the second part of our question is we live in a world that we were not created for. We do not have the kind of spirit that was created to live in the brokenness of this world. And because of original sin, because the enemy is the prince of this world, you know, scripture says that the enemy is prowling around like a lion. Scripture says it it was the enemy that has come to kill, steal, and destroy. And so there's a lot of things that I think God gets blamed for that really is the fault of the enemy. And the sin that is in this world, the fallenness of this world is really a lot of times to blame for some of the difficulties that we have. I mean, in a lot of ways, even things like, you know, we talked about this on the podcast, you know, a couple of weeks ago, even things like poverty. You know, I have the privilege of being able to serve in multiple countries around the world, and I see global poverty in a way that most people don't see it. And it's so heartbreaking. Yet I know for a fact that and we we dove into this in detail on the podcast, but I know for a fact that God has already provided the money through the system of the tithe. If churches and people were tithing the way they're supposed to, this the, the issue of poverty wouldn't even be an issue. But yet there's sin in our world. There is, you know, the enemy who has come to literally kill, steal, and destroy. And so if you're asking that question, why do bad things happen? Well, it's the answer is sin. And I hope that doesn't sound like it's a trite answer or I'm trying to, you know, not give this big, long theological discussion around it. But that is the reality of it. The reality is, is we live in a fallen world that is full of sin. And that's really what makes things difficult for us. Now, that does not mean that we are powerless against it. In fact, Scripture talks about how we have a whole 
arsenal at our fingertips with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and the word of God, we can put on the armor and we can bind the enemy and all sorts of things we can do to work around that so that we're, we're not fighting this battle alone. But until we get to the other side, until we're in heaven, we are not going to have perfected bodies or perfected lives. It's, it's just the fallenness of the world that we live in. So let's see. The second is we new, moved to a new, a new area. Can you help give me some pointers on how to find a new church? Well, there's a couple things. I think if you are in a particular denomination and you want to stay in that particular denomination, you can usually go on the denomination's website and you can find like there's usually a locator where you can find specific churches. For me, whenever I've experienced that, there's been a couple things that I have done. I would recommend thinking through the things that are on your heart that are priorities. So if you are somebody that has a family and you have kids you want to make sure there's a strong children's ministry program or a youth group kind of program. For me, one of the things that's always a high priority is what does their outreach ministry look like? Because as a missionary and somebody that is called to evangelism and discipleship, missions or outreach ministries are really important to me. So for me, even beyond the denominational aspect I would look for things like what churches in the area are doing a food pantry once a month or or so, what churches in the area have a homeless ministry or, you know, different things like that. Is anybody doing children's outreach programs? Who's doing missions, missions trips? And so I think it it comes down to maybe first kind of thinking about what kind of church you want to go to. There are family churches that are really concerned about discipling the family. There are outreach churches that are doing a lot of evangelism. What kind of church do you want? And recognizing that sometimes God might be also trying to draw you into something a little bit different than what you've been involved in in the past. So being open to that. And then I would say you have to test it. And I, I wish there was an easy way to do that, but you have to go. You have to go and you have to test it. And, you know, as you go, I would pray for discernment. I would pray, okay, God, just show me. And I think sometimes that doesn't happen in a one-time visit. Now, there are times that you can walk in the door and you feel like immediately this this feels like home. Or if they're preaching something that obviously is against God's word or, you know, you have issues with, you know, those kinds of things, that's, that's something else. But I have seen people that have hopped around to every single church in the community and just said, well, none of them really felt right. But I think sometimes you have to give it a little bit of time, you know, especially in the post COVID era that we're in. Church looks different. Church feels different. You know, a lot of times people, I think pre pandemic, regular attendance was considered twice a month. So now post pandemic, even regular attendance is considered once a month. And so you might have to give it a whole month of going consistently before you kind of even get a feel for the kinds of people that are involved in that church. And then I would look to see what discipleship opportunities are. So in addition to things like evangelism and outreach, what are the opportunities your family or that you would have to get discipled? Because, you know, scripture doesn't call us just to make converts. What does scripture say? We're called to make disciples of all nations. And so what are the discipleship opportunities? Are there Bible studies? Are there like I said, youth group, children's ministry opportunities, and not just babysitting, but are they ministering to the young people? Because that's a really good indication. If it's an unhealthy children's ministry, youth ministry, that is usually a sign of an unhealthy church and vice versa. So, and and healthy does not mean large. By healthy, I mean, are they intentional about reaching the young people of their church and their community? So those are a couple ideas of how to start. I think Honestly, the Holy Spirit is the number one sign. You know, he's going to share with you if you feel peace about that, if you feel like they are preaching biblical content, but also give it time. Sometimes you, somebody that I know said, give it the grape nuts challenge time frame. Like, I don't remember that commercial, but grape nuts, I used to, I think it was like, if you eat them for 30 days, you're going to love them or something. I don't know. I've never eaten grape nuts, but I have a friend. He says, you got to give it the grape nuts, you know, challenge where you give yourself 30 days to kind of just get a feel for everything and go, go Sunday mornings, go Wednesday night, or if they have like a midweek service, or if there's a Bible study midweek, go to those things and see what they feel like. And, you know, I think it's just almost like making up your mind that you are going to find a church. I think if you're going in with the attitude of, oh, well, I'm just not going to fit in here, then you're not. You know, I, I think some of it is it is what you make it. You know, if you go in and you go in late and you don't make eye contact and they leave early and then complain that nobody talked to you, well, 
I mean, that's just the reality of the situation you created. So you might have to get outside of your comfort zone a little bit. And, uh, you know, prayer is is key with all of that. So let's see. Okay. A big question we've been getting is if, and this is before just the, the events of the last couple of weeks, is the rapture happening soon? Are we in the end times? Now I will do, I'm going to do a separate podcast on Israel and my thoughts around that from a biblical perspective. But I think we always get the question anytime there's anything difficult happening on the world stage, oh, is this the end time? Is the rapture happening soon? And there are people that'll say, I've been having dreams and visions that this is the end times, all of that. I would say that, here's my thought on it. Jesus said that he would not come back until the whole world has heard. In the in the sense of until the whole world has had the opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel, he said he would not be coming back. That has not happened yet. And so while we are hearing wars and rumors of wars, those are signs of the end times in the sense of we're headed in that direction. But it's not necessarily a sign that the rapture is going to happen tomorrow. The skies are going to go open up and you're just going to be taken. I think if, and if you're not familiar, let me just educate you a little bit. We have over 3 billion people still that are completely unreached for the gospel. And you may think that it's less than that because of technology and all those kinds of things. But the Joshua Project, if you want to check that out, they do a really good job of estimating this and updating this. The Joshua Project estimates that there's still over 3 billion people that do not know the name of Jesus. Now, is that doable within our lifetime as far as getting the gospel to those people? Absolutely. And it might be that in my children's lifetime, we will see that number rapidly decrease because of technology, Starlink, all those kinds of things. But that's 3 billion people right now that can be born. They can live their entire lives and then they will die and never hear the gospel. Like not even just hear it and not respond, but never hear the gospel. And that is a shocking number. And also, if you think about it in terms of the amount of money that goes towards reaching unreached people groups, it's very, very small. You know, I mentioned this just a couple minutes ago. People do not take tithing very seriously. And I, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not on staff anymore at a church. This does not affect me one way or another. I'm just from an education perspective. Very few people that actually attend church will tithe. And so, the ones that do tithe, typically you see that go towards designated giving. You know, a lot of people, you know, there there's some people that just give towards a general fund in a church, but not all of them do that. Some of them say, I wanted to go towards the building fund or I wanted to go towards the food pantry or whatever. As of right now, the amount of money, and I'm just talking about the American church right now, because that's what I have data on or experience with. The amount of money that is given to unreached people groups in in terms of missions right now or I guess in terms of giving at all, it is less than the amount of money that Americans spend on Halloween costumes for their pets every year. And so that's just to give you a little bit of a comparison. Think about, okay, Halloween is one day a year and we're not talking about all Halloween costumes. We're talking about Halloween costumes for pets. That is the equivalent. Actually, that's more than what is currently given to reach unreached people groups. And so you may say, oh, we have missionaries going out. We do, but most of them are not going to unreached people groups. And so the way that that resonates with me is we still have a lot of work to do. Even though it feels like, okay, we're experiencing, you know, these kind of pains that points to the end times or points to, you know, the rapture might be happening soon. If Jesus said it's not going to happen until everybody has heard And we want that. We're longing. You know, there are some people that are praying every day to see the sky open up or to hear the trumpets call. If you really want that to happen within your lifetime, then my challenge would be, are you sharing the gospel? And and if you are, are you doing that with people that are unreached people groups? And you don't have to travel. That's the other misnomer. You don't have to travel far to find unreached people groups. There are some in the United States, and there's a lot of places actually in the United States where there are unreached people groups. We have probably more than ever, we have a lot of refugees that have come into this country and some of them are completely unreached people groups. And 
You can go to the Joshua Project to find out more specifically about where those are in your state. Or are you giving? Are you giving towards organizations that that reach unreached people groups? And if not, I would challenge you on that because if you're praying and longing for the rapture to happen and for Jesus to take you out of here, I think we're not taking seriously what he has said about that. So that's my my long rant about that. Let's see. I want to kind of keep this to 20 minutes or so. Let's see. Will we recognize our friends and family in heaven? The short answer is yes. And the long answer is we have a podcast episode coming up about that. And we're going to talk specifically about heaven and some experiences that and things that we can learn about heaven and expect from heaven. So stay tuned. That's going to be coming up in November. We're going to be having a special guest come in and talk about that. But the short answer is yes. And you have to also remember there is no sadness and no sorrow in heaven. And so there's a lot to look forward to that. So while even kind of tying into the last topic, while I understand the longing for heaven, we have to recognize that while we're still here, God has a job for us to do. The other one I want to address is the timeline of grief. Somebody had shared, actually, I've had a lot of a lot of questions on grief this past month. You know, sometimes, you know, we're talking if we're talking about somebody that has had a miscarriage, there's an expectation that the grief period might be a little bit shorter. And if you have lost a spouse or a close relative, a parent or something, it seems like there's an expectation that that grief will take longer. I just want to encourage you, first of all, to recognize that we all grieve differently. We grieve on different timelines. We grieve with different kinds of emotions. And there is no right or wrong way to grieve. And grief is unpredictable. So, you know, I myself, I have grieved different relationships differently in my lifetime. And that doesn't even necessarily mean a death. I think even when my daughter, my oldest daughter went to college, I grieved that she wasn't living in my house. I couldn't see her every day. That was a grief to me. Of course, nowhere near as serious as a death, but grief is an emotion. And I think the only way for us to go through it is to go through it, meaning God gave us tears for a reason. And and I don't know if you knew this, this is super interesting to me, but, but even when scientists will analyze our tears, there's a different chemical makeup in our tears of grief than if we were in tears of pain or tears of joy. There's a different chemical makeup and the chemicals that are released in our body when we cry are part of the way that God helps us deal with that stored emotion. And so crying is natural. Going through those stages of grief is natural. And how that happens for me is going to be different than how it happens for you. So first and foremost, let yourself off the hook. If you are still grieving three months after your miscarriage, that is between you and God and nobody else. And so If he doesn't convict you, then don't accept the conviction from anybody else or condemnation from anybody else. Or if, you know, you feel like you are really happy. Your grandma lived a really, really long, full life. She loved the Lord. Her husband has gone on to be with the Lord and she was ready to go. There can be some joy in that. And so don't allow other people to put judgment on you because perhaps you're not grieving the way that they think that you should be grieving. And also the thing about grief is it's unpredictable and there can be triggers. You know, you can be fine one day and then something triggers you the next day. That's okay. It's really between you and God. And I would say, number one, don't judge anybody else's grief process. And number two, don't allow other people to judge your grief process. That is between you and God. But also don't bottle it up. Allow yourself to express that and go through and keel from those emotions. And that might mean crying. I know for me, when my grandmother, my grandparents raised me. So when my grandparents passed, I went from crying every day to only crying on Fridays because Fridays was my day off of work. It was the day that I, you know, my kids were at school. My husband was at work. I was home alone and I would allow myself some time to cry on Fridays. And I actually think there's a blog post somewhere about it called on Fridays I cry. That was my process for the better part of a year. And I don't cry every Friday anymore, but if I pull a picture of her out of the closet, my my Nana, I I do cry sometimes. There are some things, you know, Christmas recipes that we make that bring tears to my eyes. That's okay. Allow yourself the freedom to grieve, but also invite God into that space with you because he loves to do life with you. So let's pray. God, I thank you for the heart of your children that long to know you, to learn about who you are and the ways that they can get closer to you. Lord, I pray that even now as we are getting caught up today and we're talking about some things that are heavy on people's hearts, 
God, I pray that you would be with them. You would help them to understand that you are a God of compassion and love and grace, and you long for them to be in a place where they are only concerned about an audience of one. God, I thank you, and I pray for a blessing over my friends today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, friends, we'll talk tomorrow. Hey, friends, as we lean into a new month and we continue to learn and grow together, there's a couple resources I want to make sure you know about so you can take advantage of. The first is our Patreon page, and the link for that is in the show notes. And on the Patreon page, we have a couple things. We have a dedicated space that is for discussion, for asking questions. You get easy access to me where we talk about things. We hold each other accountable. There are resources that go with the show, like a journaling prompt worksheet download for every single adult show. We also have family discussion guides. And what's really been neat about those is that on the kids show every day, I talk about the same content that's on the adult show, just taught in a way that kids can understand. Then the family discussion guides create an environment for you to process that information with your children. You can use that at the dinner table or even as part of your devotional routine. There's some suggested prayer and activities and things to help you connect that content to the appropriate age for your children. So all of that is on the Patreon. Also, there's some prophetic words, extra videos, transcripts, all those kinds of things. The second is on our website. If you go to shehears.org, there's a shop resources page that has my Bible studies that I've written, links to different journaling Bibles, note-taking Bibles, all sorts of resources to help you grow. And then also on our website, we have the coaching section. If you are finding that you need some spiritual direction or life coaching, that is available for you as well. And that's really good to help you process what you're learning. If you're feeling stuck, if you need to work through something, if something just isn't sitting right, or if you want to teach this content and you need to help develop a plan, I'm available to help you do that as well. Again, all of these are resources to help you grow in your spiritual life and hear God's voice more clearly. I want to take just a second to thank the team at Life Audio for their partnership with us on the podcast. If you go to lifeaudio.com, you will find dozens of other faith-centered podcasts in their network. They've got shows about prayer, Bible study, parenting, and more. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you in your walk with God, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, bonus content, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you. Know that you are so loved. Keep going. Keep going.